Hey, what's happening? FTD fam, I got another video by Rabbi Tobias Singer. He's gonna be looking at the Lord's Prayer, and when you analyze it, according to him, it really shatters core Christian concepts. But that's such a central prayer in Christianity, so what is he talking about? The key point of the, the Lord's Prayer is that it's thoroughly anti-Christian. Really? This is like the first time I'm hearing this. Rabbi Tovia Singer, always drop in these bombs, man. You are live. Please tell us your name and where you're calling from. Ah, my name is Eric uh, from Grand Rapids, Michigan. I uh, love what you guys do. It's uh, amazing. I love listening to you guys. I love, I love Rabbi Tovia Singer. My question is, I'd love to hear the good rabbi break down or analyze the Our Father prayer given to us by Jesus. I find it interesting, a lot of interesting things in that. I'd be I'm curious to his opinion to, to take a look at that, where you actually ask to be judged the way that you judge or forgiven the way that you forgive. I'd be really curious. Thank you, and uh, bless you bless you both. Thank you very much. Awesome. Right. Great question. Go ahead and hang up now to you for your answer. Bye-bye. We waited, what, seven years for someone to ask a question about the Lord's Prayer? It's a, a very important question because, as it turns out, the Lord's Prayer, which could be found in Matthew and Luke. So it's a what's called a Q source, which means that there are passages that are found in both Matthew and Luke but are not found in Mark. And there are more than 200 such passages like that. And the Q source is composed of the putative sayings of Jesus. And it's likely to be more ancient than what you would find in an M source, what you would mean a, a unique source for Matthew, a unique source for Luke. Uh, it may very well predate Mark. The key point of the, the Lord's Prayer is that it's thoroughly anti-Christian. So we find the Lord's Prayer in both the Sermon of the Mount, that's in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, moving forward, about five, six passages, and then you find it again in Luke chapter 11. Now, what's very striking about these passages is just it's there are certain differences in the passages. In these passages, whether in Luke or in Matthew, you don't have Christologies like Pauline Christologies of vicarious atonement or praying in the name of Jesus or any of that. But what is very striking is what you raised. How does one get an atonement? So the Lord's Prayer begins with first, Our Father who is in heaven, mm -hmm. hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. And then it goes into Forgive a number us of requests our trespasses. that the person in prayer is supposed to ask for, asking for daily bread. But that's not what's very striking about the Lord's Prayer. What's striking about it is that the manner in which man is tempted is directly from God, not from Satan. Hmm. And in the Lord's Prayer, there is a request that God lead not, us not lead us into temptation. In the Christian theology, this is utterly antithetical to the teachings of Paul, to the teachings in Hebrews, to the, the whole idea that really God never leads anyone into, into temptation, but God is perfectly righteous, and it's a malnevolent effort of Satan, who was an enemy of God, who God, who is Lucifer, a term not used in the New Testament, but who is the who is Satan, and Satan is in rebellion against God, and he is the one who is the chief blasphemer of God. He is the great opposer of God, and he's the one who is leading us into temptation, and he is the one that no one can overcome except through the cross. But there is none of that in the Lord's Prayer. So again, you have the Lord's Prayer in Matthew, and you have not the exact same form. Yeah, different but wording. Very similar, somewhat more truncated in right in the beginning of Luke chapter 11. So when the text says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, what do you mean lead us not into temptation? It's more like a mistranslation God in English. Leading anyone into temptation in Christian theology, in Pauline theology. It's Satan that's doing that. Hmm. So this idea is not just parav. 
this part segment of the prayer is not just sort of ambiguous, it's thoroughly anti Christian. <laughs> Good point. Theology, wow. God doesn't lead anyone to temptation. Satan does, or people are in temptation because of the original sin, which we are all born into, which we have all been infected with. But then it gets more interesting. In verse 14 in the Sermon of the Mount, it says, if you forgive others for trespasses, God will forgive you for your sins. Did you hear that? If, and you have very similar passage like that in Luke. The way that you get an atonement for your sins, we are told in the Lord's Prayer, both in Matthew and in Luke, is by forgiving others for their sins, then God will forgive you for your sins. Well, where does that come from? It surely doesn't come from 2 Corinthians 5.21. Not only doesn't it come from any Pauline idea— this source is thoroughly different than Matthew's own source for vicarious atonement. That's Matthew chapter 20, verse 28, where we're told that Jesus died as a ransom for our sins. He died as a ransom for our sins. Is, is that the spiritual economy? Is that the dispensation that we are under? In Christian theology, there's no effort of men, nothing man can do to gain his own salvation. You right. can't be saved by forgiving others for what they've done. In Christian theology, there is nothing you can do by your own effort or through your own initiative that can save you. Nothing. The only way you can be saved is through the cross. The same passage that you find in Matthew 20, verse 28, you find in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Without Jesus, there's no atonement. And in fact, if you believe it and you're baptized, you're saved, Mark 16. Mm -hmm. And if you believe it not, you're damned. So what's very striking about the Lord's prayer is not that it just doesn't uh, contain Christologies, but it, it is in fact, opposes the core teachings of the church in these fundamental ways. And how is man drawn to sin? Well, as it turns out, if you go to the Torah, I know you didn't expect this, <laughs> because you expect me to just tell you how horrible the Lord's Prayer is, but if you go to the Torah in Deuteronomy 30, God says, before you, I have placed life and death, good and evil, and you must choose life that you may live. So God is the one that places good and evil, as we find in Isaiah 45, verse 7, that God creates good and evil. And I know the NIV in some translations trans ra as destruction or calamities. That ra means evil. Hmm. So as it turns out, the core Christologies of the church are opposed by the Sermon on the Mount. Now, you go, well, what gives? Well, as it turns out, something I've shared with you, people have asked me, is there anything good in the New Testament? Is there anything true in the New Testament? And of course there are. There are okay. many passages that are true. But anything true in the New Testament isn't new, and anything new in the New Testament isn't true at all. Hmm. So... The okay. Lord's Prayer, as it turns out, is thoroughly unchristian. I would not encourage anyone to pray from the Lord's Prayer. I wouldn't encourage people to use any part of the Christian Bible as a source for edification. I mean, you can find in any holy book ideas that are consistent with Judaism, of course but use a, a Jewish verse. I wouldn't be using the New Testament. But as it turns out, the teachings that you find in the Lord's Prayer are not consistent with Paul and are not consistent with Matthew. And you're going, well, how could that be? Well, the answer is that Matthew is using many different sources. He's using almost all the book of Mark. It's one of the parts the of the Bible, of Bible too, that has been changed the, the most also, in translation. The book of Mark appears in the book of Luke. He's using a source which 
itself did not survive. It's called accused source. You can call it whatever you want. But he's relying on, on that source that Luke had access to, but Mark did not. And then he has some other sources that are completely unique to Matthew that you won't find anywhere else. And Luke is using, are, is using all those sources, except he doesn't have the M source. He's using the L source. This is really very simple stuff. This Lord's Prayer is a Q source. It's shared by Matthew and Luke, but it is utterly antithetical to Christian teachings. It's not God who tempts people, but it's Satan who tempts people. Why are you asking God to, to not tempt me? And more importantly, this is how you get an atonement for your sins. Forgive other people for what they've sinned against you, and then God will forgive you. No cross, no blood, no lamb, no Golgotha, none of that. The Lord's Prayer, therefore, is completely opposed by embellished Christian theology. Thank you. You know, that passage is pretty interesting because it's often used as a, a template in Christianity for prayer. But yeah, when you look at passages like it lead us not into temptation, you know, some argue that that's actually a mistranslation and what it should say is something more like don't allow us to be led into temptation. But, you know, a lot of the language is lost when you bring it from a different language into the English language, certain things are lost like that. So some modern Bibles, they do have a translation where it's like, uh, don't allow us to be led into temptation, but deliver us from evil. So they kind of reword it. Now, whether or not the original source said it like that, um, that's debatable. But I do know that the Lord's Prayer is one of the parts of the Bible that have seen significant change through translation and everything. And depending on the Bible that you read, you're going to find different uh, wording. And uh, it may even sound like a different prayer altogether. Even when you look at Matthew and Luke's account, it's a different wording. That It's not exactly the same. So it's like, well, which one was the word of Jesus, if any of them were the word of Jesus? So there's a lot of different questions that come up, and I, I think it's, um, it's been challenging for Christians to really set out a solid answer and rebuttal for challenges like this that Rabbi Tovia Singer did bring up. So for you guys watching this, are you in agreement with Rabbi Tovia Singer that this is just completely anti-Christian, everything that's outlined in the prayer? Do you think that he took this passage out of context and that he's missing something? Or do you believe that, yeah, he's 100% dead on? Whatever you think, let me know down below in the comment section. For me, I think a lot of it is when it comes to English translations of uh, the Bible, you can't necessarily rely on it as the word for word because we've seen so many times where just the English, just it's not accurately translated or it doesn't give the full picture or it may lead you to believe something just with like a small change in the translation that it's completely different when you look at the source text you're like oh interesting so yeah i, I don't think that this is a word for word translation i don't think that this is 100 percent the words of jesus just based off of my studies and my understanding of uh biblical translations so that's just my two cents on it guys let me know what you think if you did enjoy this video leave a like and i'll catch you guys in the next episode